I was north of Fort Wilkins East Campground. I had stopped off there to get a look at Lake Superior. It was late November day and things were getting choppy. No one else was out there. It was maybe a half an hour from sunset. Gloomy, gray. I took the dogs there. Three dogs. They liked to run on the red rock beach. And one of them, a black lab shepherd mix, Cooter, loved any chance he could get to jump in any water he could. The other two dogs were more conservative with the water, but loved sniffling and running around the woods along the shoreline. My dogs always stayed close to me whenever we went out. They had been cohorting over the east side of the shore as I was walking due west. I could hear them barking and splashing and whatnot behind me. Then all the sound from them just stopped, just suddenly stopped. I turned and looked back to the east and I saw all three of my dogs standing in a line, shoulder to shoulder style. They were lined up facing me. Their ears were up and their tails were up. And they were all the same distance apart. I will admit it shocked me. I think I jumped, then I started laughing. It was an odd one, I'll tell you that. It was a strange sight, them sitting there all quiet and whatnot, but standing like that, like they are standing at attention and not moving. I called to them and they did not move. I started walking over and the whole time I was calling. Even Cooter, who was always eager to play, did not move a muscle. He would not even look at me. Cooter had a real personality, you know, so that was strange to me. Of course, by this time I was looking back over my shoulder, trying to see what they had in their sights. I could not see anything. I got over to them and started petting them. They just rocked back and forth as I pushed them, but they did not move and still would not even look at me. I have to tell you, that was really concerning. I never experienced anything like that before, and I had been around dogs my whole entire life. No sir, that was just about as weird as it gets. I was about to pull on Laddie's collar when I see something across the bay. A thin fog had started swallowing up the shore, so I could not really make it out so well. But I could see a bushy animal coming down the rocks. At first it looked like a giant patchwork of fur, like an old timer's fur pelts. It was big like a bear, but the shape was not the same and it definitely did not move like a bear. Then the thing stopped on the shore across the crescent and stood there for a minute. The fog half hit him. I could not tell if he was looking our way or exactly what was going on. Then I could see he began moving down the shoreline toward us and something still did not look right about the way he was moving. I just could not get my head around the thing. As he got closer I could clearly make out it was an animal. Then it dropped to all fours and continued moving toward us along the shore. It was some kind of giant wolf, and I mean giant, a big son of a bitch. I turned back to get my dogs out there and I was gosh darn puzzled. All three of my dogs were lying on their backs with their feet folded. I did not know what to think. I do remember feeling that maybe they had been poisoned because they were on their backs lying there frozen. I mean their eyes were open, they were breathing, but they were just not moving, and just staring straight up. I had to deal with this wolf coming at us, so I thought I would pick them up and carry them back to my truck. But I tried to pick up Cooter and got a mouthful of teeth. That dog had never so much as gave me a dirty look in the ten years I had him. I screamed at him, but he just rolled his head back and froze in position again on the ground. I tried the same thing with Laddie and got the same response. I did not even attempt to pick up Rat because he was always ornery to begin with. What the hell is wrong with you mutts? I started screaming. I remember I looked up then because I will admit I was having some panic. I wanted to spy the wolf wandering a couple hundred yards away. Fortunately the thing had not yet taken to running yet. But it had wandered closer and I could see it was a massive terrifying thing. I never saw a black wolf like that before. Not in pictures, not on television, nothing. It began walking faster in our direction. And then I watched the thing rise up and keep walking on two legs. I mean it started walking on two legs just like a human. I thought, this can't be a wolf. And it was not walking awkwardly. 
It was walking naturally, but not like a man. I was still trying to figure out what the hell the thing was when it leaned forward and started running in our direction. Then it dropped to four legs, then up on two again. I hate to admit it, but I took off. I left my dogs there and just ran back to the truck. I felt bad. I know it was the act of a coward, but that is what happened. I had a rifle and a shotgun, both in the gun rack, back of the truck, and I kept thinking if I could just make it back there, I would get the guns and go back and get the dogs. I did not make it back, even halfway to the truck when I heard the thing. I could tell it was a howl, like a husky dog or wolf, but it sounded like a scream of a person at the same time. And most of all, it was loud way too loud to be an actual person screaming. I got the gun and started back, and when I got back to the spot, they were gone. All three of my dogs gone. But about a year later, one of my neighbors, Brian Gilbert, told me he saw Cooter. I asked him, are you sure it was Cooter? He told me, I sure am, it was him. He had the same marks on his face, but he didn't act the same. Brian told me that he saw Cooter staring at him from the woods north of Hunter's Point. He said he stepped just outside the edge of the woods and stood there watching him. Then he told me that he heard other dogs barking and Cooter disappeared back into the woods. Yeah, he looked the same, but he didn't act the same. He looked like a wild dog. He looked different, Brian told me. Then he said, I called to him, but he showed his teeth and started growling. Guess he joined the wolf pack. Guess so, I agreed. I would not want to be out there after dark anymore, Brian said. I had told Brian we were attacked by a wolf, but I did not share the whole story because I did not want to seem crazy and did not want them to know what a coward I was for leaving my dogs. Not that I could have done anything to stop it, but I still feel bad about it. But the story gets even darker. It was about 10 years later, long after all three of my dogs would have died from natural causes. I went on a fishing trip. Myself, Roger Jonas, and Bill Fenton were tooling around looking for a new lake to drop in. We try one of the inland lakes south of Copper Harbor. We found a lake there. Never been on it before. It was overgrown, isolated, and wild looking. We weren't even sure there would be a lake there when we started navigating down the dirt road. And then the dirt road died and trees we stopped us from going any and trees we stopped us from going any further with the truck. Then the dirt road died, and the trees would stop us from going any further with the truck. But we could see water breaking through the weeds, so we made the walk through the overgrowth. We stumbled down to the shore, and immediately we were all game. Let's do it, let's put in. This is the place, Bill said. And we agreed. It looked like Lake that time forgot. I thought there must be some giants in there. What the hell? It isn't private property. Let's give her a try, Roger smiled. But before we could even turn around to head back to the boat, across the lake we saw three dogs walk out of the woods. These dogs were wild, muscular, shaggy, and dirty, and they stopped at the opposing lake's edge. They were not happy to see us. They ducked their heads and showed their teeth, and we could hear them growling. Hey, that looks like Cooter, don't he? Bill pointed. I'll be damned, Roger gasped. They all three look like your old dogs, Paul. He stopped staring. Don't it? Same spots, same markings? How could it be? That ain't right, Bill shook his head. It can't be, I told them. They would be dead for years now. Then the dogs took off around the west edge of the lake heading toward us. Let's get, Bill said. We ran back to the truck. I shut the door of the truck just as Roger started backing out. I could see Cooter as he rounded the corner about 50 feet away from us, followed by the others. It was Cooter. I could see all three of them. Those were my dogs. How the hell could they still be alive? Roger wheeled the truck around and we startled down the road and we started down the road. We could see the other dogs now were filling out of the woods to join them. You see that? Where the hell are they all coming from? Bill stumbled out. The woods was full of them. We were lucky to get out of there, Roger exhaled. I don't know, I said. Bill and I were out the back window of the trucks as we drove away. Bill and I were looking out the back window of the truck as we drove away. The dogs stopped chasing us. 
They started roaming in one place, and we could see them. That is Cooter. I remember Cooter. That's your old dog, Paul. I don't know how, but that is your dog, Bill nodded to me. I don't know how they could still be alive, but they sure did not act old. They did not act like the dogs I knew. What the hell was that? Roger asked. I can't believe that. It's just not possible. I told them. Maybe they had puppies? Roger asked. That wasn't any offspring. That was your dogs, Paul, Bill concluded. Brockway Mountain Drive is one of the most beautiful places in the world. I was in the service for almost 10 years. I saw a lot of the world, and still that place between Copper Harbor and the Upson Nature Sanctuary is one of the most beautiful. But on that day in December, the beauty was lost on me. My car was a mess. It was this rusted old coughing Ford Escort mini station wagon. It was on its last breath, but I really thought I could squeeze one more winter out from it. But as I rolled to the top of the Brockway Plateau just west of Copper Harbor, I had had enough. It died. It would not start, and it immediately got cold as a witch's titty in a brass bra. I already had a rusted out floorboard that caused snow and or slush to spit up in my face while I was driving, and the passenger window was double thick saran wrap duct taped together. So when it died on the top of the hill, I took a minute and got out and had a smoke, then prepared for the ritual. The ritual was me heaving to push the car down the hill and pop the clutch to get it started, and today my hope was only to make it back home. I had to get a new car. The time had come. I put it in neutral and pushed the escort to the edge of the plateau, and with the driver's door open, gave her one last shove and then jumped in. Down the hill I went. Shit! I popped the clutch, and for the first time, the damn thing did not turn over. It rolled to the lull at the bottom of the road and just stopped. Shit. Now I was stuck here until someone came along to give me a ride and I had no idea how long that was going to be. And to make things worse, I was down to my last smoke. I did not even bother to push the escort off the road. I was so pissed off, I just sat there and lit up my last Marlboro. I was leaning back, cold as hell, and facing west, looking at the snow, trees, and the little tiny unlined patched up pothole-ridden pavement with a giant animal walks dead center about 200 yards away. I almost choked on my cigarette. I was leaning back, cold as hell, and facing west, looking at the snow, trees, and the little tiny unlined patch-up pothole-ridden pavement, when a giant animal walks dead center, about 200 yards away. I almost choked on my cigarette. I felt all the hair on my body standing straight up. I lived in the Upper Peninsula, and we got so used to things, we sometimes forget that we are in the wilderness up here. And what the hell was this thing? I remember thinking, oh my god, as it stopped in the middle of the road, just started casually walking towards me. I was, it was so terrifying for so many reasons. It was big, and it was coming at me. I was alone in a car that would not start. I had no idea what the hell it was. I immediately started turning the ignition. Come on, come on, come on, I started screaming. I was about to get out and run back up to the hill, to the plateau, to the east, behind me, the same hill I just had rolled down. But to my shock, the escort started. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. I was so happy. Then this crazy looking walking dogs started yelling and began charging at me on all fours like a bull galloping at me. I wheeled the escort wagon around and puttered my way up the hill. I had already accepted death. That escort wagon would not make a getaway from a child on a big wheel. All I could do was floor it and hope I purred up the hill and made it over the peak to the other side, headed toward Copper Harbor. I was so thankful the car did not die on me. I looked back and saw the devil spawn standing on the top of the hill, all proud and boastful, howling and screaming. Please make it back to town, I kept saying, and I made it back to town. After that, I did get another car, but I never sold the escort. I just could not part with her after she had saved my life from that dog man. 
It started off innocent enough. We had a cabin in Copper Harbor where we would go play cards, drink, and fish. Then one day, Johnny asked me, Did you ever hear about the Michigan Dog Man? I told him, Yeah, I know, they tell stories about that. He said he had a plan to scare our friend and his cousin with a Dog Man prank. His cousin Frankie was coming up from, a Cadillac, coming up from Cadillac to hang out with us for the first time, and he had never been to the Upper Peninsula before. Johnny told me that Frankie was obsessed with this dog man thing because one of the, his neighbors saw it when he was a kid. The plan was that Johnny was going to patchwork together a wolf head, wolf fur, and sneak up on Frankie after we led him outside behind the cabin. You sure you want to be walking around in fur back there? Someone else might not think it's funny and shoot you, I told him. Of course, Johnny had an answer for it. He always had an answer for everything. He told me he would be wearing a Kevlar vest underneath and shockproof helmet in the head portion. Well, I went to see his dogman suit. It was an impressive thing, I will admit. He hung it out back and shot it. He took a bat to it. He used a bayonet on it. It really was a fortress of a suit. After the prank, I will use it as a bear suit. It's bear proof, I'm sure, he told me. He must have spent a month building the damn thing. A month later, we were all in the cabin. We were laughing and getting drunk. We must have been on our third case of paps. Then Johnny gives me the look and heads out. The plan was to give him 15 minutes and then take Frankie out to see the new boat I had ported over the hill. Then Johnny would sneak up behind us and scare the hell out of Frankie. What a hoot. Johnny and me were the only ones in on it, so I expected it would be a gas to see the looks on everyone's faces. About 20 minutes had passed and I pulled the guys outside to go see the new boat. We had not taken any more than a few steps outside when we all noticed the fog. This was serious, pea soup thick fog. Holy cow, Frankie said. This is straight off superior, Doug boasted. It's gonna rain in cats and dogs tomorrow. We had to navigate slower than expected, but we made it down to the boat, looked around and then started back. We were walking back and I was expecting any minute for the prank to go down. It was the perfect night for it. I knew it was going to scare the hell out of these guys. It was going to be hilarious. I got more and more excited with every step, but it never came. I started to slow our pace and I was stalling for time. I need another beer, Doug belched. Yeah, I'm getting cold, Steve echoed. I was thinking I would not be able to keep these guys out in the woods and the fog for much longer. And then I hear it. A bone-curdling howl. What the hell? Doug recoiled. They stopped. I was laughing inside, and I did not expect the howl, but it really made the moment, I thought. It's the dog man, Frankie whispered. You might be right about that, I encouraged. Come on, let's roll, Steve ordered. Steve started a soft jog, but we really could not go very fast in the fog, and to try to do so more treacherous than Johnny's fake dogman, and to try to do so was more treacherous than Johnny's fake dogman. Then, maybe 50 feet behind us, blasted another odd, startling howl. It even scared me. I was not expecting it, so we all jumped into the air together. Okay, this isn't funny anymore, Steve said. It never was, Frankie answered. Then, just out of the view in the fog, came the howl again, even louder. Oh man, this shit is seriously scary, I thought to myself. Circle up, men. Faces out, Steve commanded us. Steve watched too many movies and served too few years in the service. Never a good combination. I laughed. Faces out? I asked him. Faces out, he ordered us as he pushed our backs together. Did you say feces out? I asked because I think I just shit myself, I joked. Then it got quiet as we could hear something walking toward us in the fog behind. Three of us had flashlights and we shined them where we could hear the walking. I was expecting Johnny to jump from the fog because he had really worked everyone up into a frenzy. If it's a wolf pack, we gotta make sure they don't surround us. Let's keep walking, Doug whispered. Hold it, Steve said while he wiggled his flashlight beam through the fog pointing north. Then we all stopped cold. We could see this thing coming through the fog, about six or seven feet tall, 
these pointed ears walking straight through the fog like hair on the devil's horns. Dogmen, Frankie whispered. It was all I could do to keep from laughing out loud. Then the dogman just stood out of full view in the dark fog. It was growling and snarling. If this is someone playing a joke, you ain't funny, Doug warned. There are four of us, and you are about to get your ass kicked, Rough Rider, Steve threatened. Then the thing moved. It threw something at us, and I could not make it out at first. It was a massive pile of fur. Steve kept his flashlight pointed in the direction of the dogman, while Doug scanned the thing that just dropped at our feet. That is when I caught sight of the Johnny's Kevlar vest. I didn't get it. Why is he crimping the joke? That's just confusing, I thought. Where the hell is Johnny? Doug asked. Oh, his ass is not funny. He thinks this is cute, Steve said. We can no longer see the dogman in the fog. And then we hear maybe 100 yards away a wild howl. And then a few seconds later, another howl even farther away. Doug screamed, Is that you, Johnny? I'm going to kick your ass. Let's roll, that punk, Steve said. The three of them laughed and took a breath. The mood noticeably changed. Now they were joking and I was confused. We jogged back and they were looking for Johnny. Johnny Wolfman, where are you? Doug called. We walked back in the cabin and returned to drinking. Johnny did not show. It was a pretty good gag though, Steve perked up. That shit looked real. Yeah, I'll give it to him. That must have taken a full year to plan out, Doug laughed. I don't know. Where is he? Are you guys sure? Frankie wondered. Frankie got up wondering back and forth. Frankie paced around the cabin and only drank in between concerned looks out the window. Frankie, your cousin did this for you. It's all that Michigan dogman talk in the Cadillac. Doug started. He is rousing you good. We busted out the cards and cigars and we started playing Hold'em and barely finished dealing when we hear whimpering coming from outside. We all got up without saying a word. Chairs were pushed back, scraped the floor, and we stamped toward down the drop bolt and threw it open. Johnny pushed his way in past us and slammed the door behind him. He was stuttering, he was shaking, he was bleeding and trying to catch his breath. He stepped back from the door and stared at us. As he talked, his voice was shaking so bad we could hardly understand him. At that point, I still thought it was part of his gag. He just didn't tell me about the twist so he could scare me along with them. But when I saw the gash in his face, I thought he was taking it too far. What the fuck is going on, Johnny? I slammed. It's not funny anymore. They know you were setting them up. I walked over to him and grabbed his face. This is going too far, I started, but Johnny interrupted. Are you fucking crazy? Do you think I sliced my face up? Johnny cried. You better get that taped up, Steve said as he went to get that yellow first aid kit from under the sink. Doug, can you run me to an MD? Johnny asked. What's going on? Frankie asked. Look, you guys. I was trying to prank Frankie with the dogman thing when something out there attacked me. It ripped right through the Kevlar. What the hell does that? Johnny rambled out. He stood there breathing, his chest heaved up and down. The rest of us all stood there in silence. No one really knew what to think. And then Doug goes up to Johnny with the alcohol and bandages and sits him down. Well, if it was a prank, you sure picked a hell of a thing to ruin your face for. Doug and Steve started cleaning and inspecting his injuries. Yeah, this is too deep. We need to chopper him to the medic ASAP, Steve ordered. Steve's military jar jargon was not funny anymore. Yeah, maybe he was a little too into the whole super soldier action movies. But I gotta give it to him, he was pretty good in an emergency. And this thing suddenly turned into an emergency. Because just after sitting him down, Doug had to catch Johnny falling out of his chair. He passed out. And that was when we noticed the blood pulling up in his shirt and trailing from the floor. We got him medical help in time. He had deep scratches, gouges, but nothing that hit an artery or anything. But it was certainly going to leave scars. I asked the doctor who cleaned up Johnny and dressed his wounds if Johnny could have done that himself. No. If this was a stunt, he had to have someone else do it to him. There is no way someone could dig a scratch from that cheekbone to the scapula like that. 
the doctor started, then why would he do it to himself? No, I was just wondering if he accidentally took a joke too far. Never mind, I sputtered out. The doctor started walking away and then told me, I've seen bear attacks that leave marks like that when I was interning in it. When I was interning in Alaska. A bear? I clarified. Yeah, if it is a bear, we need to alert the DNR, he finished. Yeah, okay, understood, I finished. The next day, I retrieved the Kevlar fur mess left sitting down the hill from the cabin where it had been tossed at us. It looked like it had been crushed in a vise and twisted by a crane. I just could not imagine what could do that. Johnny later told me that the thing attacked him, bit him, his jaws, his jaws just ripped right through my vest. I asked him if it was a bear. He told me, you know, it wasn't a bear. Steve told me what you guys saw. He shook his head at me. It was not as big as a bear. It was walking dog of some kind. It attacked me out there and I'm wearing the thing and it, it attacked me. Come on, you really didn't do this? I asked. Fuck you, Johnny spit out at me. Look at me, I'm mangled up for life, for what? I did not know what to say to him. It, that thing, saw another walking dog out there and it did not think it was funny. And then he got curious. I did not think that thing was real. How many more of them do you think there are? Is there more than one? In the years afterward, Johnny never tried to market the story and he never wanted to talk about it. Then one Saturday, when I went to see him, we were hanging out laughing and talking about other stuff and his face struck me. It really was so mangled up. The scar did not heal well. It was really a mess. And that was when I realized he had been telling the truth. It was never a joke and it was not a prank. Something really did attack him that night. Every year on my summer holiday, on the past 14 or so years now, I've been going to Audache in southern France. My family and I always stay in a camping site near an ancient little village in the mountains. It's one of those villages that slowly turned into a ghost town because most people moved to the city. Now the people there are very kind, but one thing that actually amazed me is that almost all of them believed in the existence of werewolves otherwise known as loup Garou in French. This might be because of the werewolf trials in France in the 1700s. Many people's lives were taken back then. Because they were accused of being werewolves, I like going to small villages like the one we camped near to. I often went there to take pictures of the beautiful old buildings, but when I came to know that these days, the people of the countryside were very heavy with their supernatural creature beliefs, I decided to ask the villagers if it was really true. The man I spoke to was very kind and open at first, but when I asked him more and if and why anyone around the area still believes in werewolves, he got very weird and strange about it. There was a very serious and scared expression on his face and he told me we shouldn't discuss this outside out on the street. He led me over to his nearby backyard, away from the prime ears of his neighbors, and when he got us both something to drink, he said with a very timid voice, he said that the town had a very strange secret since around the Second World War. He told me that what they believe to be a werewolf has been stalking around the village and the countryside for roughly 70 or so years. He even said that this very beast lives in the village. During a full moon, you can actually hear its sinister howling coming from the nearby countryside out in the woods. Cattle will sometimes mysteriously go missing or found slaughtered. Since this area was part of a huge national park, so it wasn't strange that you could encounter some wildlife like deer or boar on the road or near your own home. But the man said that everyone, or at least all the elderly people, have seen it and believe the town's secret to be true. Some rumors suppose that the werewolf had been heard or even seen inside the village itself. 
while listening to the man's story, I thought about going through this village again at night to explore the edge of the woods. I wanted to know how true this was. I wanted to know what they thought was terrorizing them since around World War II. Was it simply a rare species of animal, or was it like as the movies show, the werewolf that passes on its curse to someone else through a full moon? And I wasn't sure I believed any of it, but I really wanted to. When the man was done with the story, I thanked him profusely for his time and the drink he got me as well, and then I headed back to the campsite. That same night, I grabbed my flashlight, called my parents, and told them I was going on a late night walk, and I walked over to the village. I remember that the moon was full that night, and when I walked through the silent village, everyone had said their homes as the streets were empty. I did suddenly hear a howl in the distance. I immediately stood frozen, my senses on extremely high alert, and realized that, even though I came out to explore and find something, I didn't actually believe I would see or hear anything. The hairs on my neck stood straight back up, and I was regretting every decision. For a few minutes after that, it was silent, just when I thought it was a dog or maybe some distant wolf. I heard a howl that was much closer now and this howl was so much more sinister and weird. I could hear it better the closer it got, and it seemed to me unlike anything I've ever heard. I wasn't sure if wolves even lived in the wild in France anymore, and I was beginning to get really anxious just because the howling got closer with every call. Now, I'm a bigger guy for my age, and I'd like to say that I'm pretty tough, but I'll be completely honest with you. I was nearly soiling myself at the sound of that whole at the sound of that howl closing in, and I don't remember a time when I was ever more scared. The only thing that kept me from hurrying back to camp was my general curiosity, and you know how that saying goes. I had heard of the Loop Guru, and I wanted to see one with my own eyes. Being skeptical about werewolves is one thing, but seeing something like that in real life, that would be thrilling, even though it's probably a terrible idea. Not even five minutes later, I heard the final howl, and when I saw a long, eerie shadow on the road in front of me, I nearly had a heart attack. The shadow was nothing more than a silhouette, as it was still dark. It looked like a rather large and bulky stray dog, and I could see it there, its furry body and long snout, but it wasn't alone. There was another one slowly revealing its head behind a house nearby. This one also had the same pointy ears and bulky body build. Even on all fours, these things nearly stood at around elbow height to me. They stared at me for a while until one of them lurched forward suddenly toward the road I was on. I now had a closer look at at least one of them. It definitely looked more wolf-like than anything else. And now that its teeth were bared, I could see how big its teeth were. Its eyes reflected a cold ice blue when it hit my flashlight, and its body hunched down versus being on all fours. I was able to see just how muscular this thing was. I was frozen, and I was amazed and scared at the same time. I remember thinking that you should never turn your back on a wild animal and start running since predators determined to chase you, since predators decide to usually chase you. So I turned back slowly, staring my eyes into the creature. For every step I took, the thing took one as well, keeping pace with me and snarling. I walked a little faster, and as I kept walking, I needed to watch my steps carefully, because if I fell, I was done for. The animal was still following me and snarling, I soon noticed there was, they were actually gaining on me, and I began to panic and walked even faster. I knew better than to look away from it though. I was nearly at the edge of the village now, and I grew a little excited thinking I was nearly back to my family. But then I realized outside the village that would be an even better place for them to attack me. Surely though, if they wanted me, wouldn't they have got me already? It's not like they couldn't. Maybe I was just hoping they were just being territorial and simply wanting me out or trying to chase me away. When I finally passed the last of the buildings at the edge of town, the creature haunted and just stood there. 
I was overjoyed. Maybe they were just territorial. And where the village began, the animals' territory ended. But I didn't stop, and I didn't stop looking back at them. I simply backed away even faster than before. I kept watching the one that stood at the edge of the village staring back at me until I could no longer see it. And from that moment, I ran the two and a half miles back to the campsite as quickly as I could, continuously looking behind me to see if I was being pursued. I blazed back to my campsite, and when I got back, I collapsed. I was so exhausted, and my adrenaline had been pumping for the last two and a half miles. My parents had asked me what was going on, why I'd come back running like the devil was after me. But since I knew my dad wouldn't believe my story, I ended up telling my mom what had happened. I was in disbelief at my own situation, so it kind of comforted me when she confirmed that she had also heard a creepy howling coming from the woods. Even my dad said he had heard the howling too. That night, I could barely sleep after what had happened, and the following day I went back to the village to see the man, the guy who told me the story originally. When he opened his door, I told him that I had encountered the same thing that he had. This time, we sat in the backyard again, and I gave him all the details, and he listened very closely to me, and when I was done with my story, he admitted to me that many of the other villagers and him had watched the events last night unfold before their eyes and watched me flee. This happened to me in June of 1996. I have lived in Michigan my whole life. I was living in Copper Harbor, just south of Copper Harbor proper when it happened. I had worked in lumber my whole life, even when I was a kid. So I spent most of my time around the woods and mill plants. When we first moved up there, it was great, very peaceful, and we got a good piece of land, so we were happy. That summer, early June, our seven-year-old Tommy asked if he could have some leftovers for the dog. We did not have a dog, so I assumed it was just his imaginary playmate. But my wife, she was worried that maybe there was a wild animal. Our backyard was up against the woods, true enough, but it was fenced off an all-weather stained fence buried about two feet down. I was not worried that any animal was going to get over it or through it. I knew Tommy was just playing. I would keep an eye on him in the backyard when he would horse around and the only time he would even, or he would be even briefly out of view was when he weaved behind the large maple and clumps of sumac. As the summer wore on, Tommy would play in the backyard. You know, digging, throwing the ball with his friends and stuff that kids do. And in late June, he comes in and asks for a f food for the dog. I asked him about his dog. Can I meet your dog? I asked him. No, he does not like grown-ups. He will not come around if he were there, he told me. Okay, just make sure to keep him on that side of the fence, okay? I told him. Okay, he laughed and went back out. Then I sneaked out to see Tommy throwing hot dogs over the fence. I could hear nothing out there on the other side of the fence. I just laughed and went back to sharpening my handsaw. Then I swear I heard snarling. I stopped the wheel and ran over, and there was Tommy climbing down from the stepladder next to the fence. He had a smile on his face and nothing appeared to be wrong. Later at dinner, Tommy asked if he could take the scraps out to his dog. His mother looked at me and winked because after I talked with her, she realized Tommy's dog was imaginary. Sure, his mother told him. Will that be enough? Yep, Tommy said. He pushed away from the table and ran outside happy. It is good to see a happy seven-year-old. And if all it takes is an imaginary pet, then so be it. His mother and me sat there talking about his imaginary friend and dog were laughing. And then Tommy runs back in. Mom, can I have some more? He is really, really, really hungry today. His mother laughed and gave him a large soup bone and gristle from the stew she made. Tommy ran back outside. About a half hour later, Tommy comes back in and started watching TV. How's your dog friend? I asked him. Good, he was happy. He's full, I think. Tommy told me he sat watching a cartoon video from earlier. It was the next day, Saturday. After dinner, I went to put the lawnmower inside the shed, and I saw the boy throwing pork bones or pork chop bones over the fence. 
He stood there, talking to his imaginary dog friend, then reached over to the fence to pet him. Good boy, he said. Just then his mother came out and saw this. She laughed. Oh, he can pet his head just over the fence. That must be a big dog. We both smiled and laughed as Tommy climbed down the stepladder. Then I whispered to his mother, Yeah, keep him in the house for a few minutes, will ya? I need to go out there and clean that stuff up. He's been throwing food over the fence for the past three days. We're going to have raccoons moving in if I don't clean it up. Tommy! Tommy, come on! His mother called to him. Tommy ran excitedly to his mother. His mother told him, Let's have some cake and watch Scooby-Doo, okay? Tommy was happy for that and ran jumping in the house with his mother, holding his hand. Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo, Tommy began, and this was immediately followed by his singing the Scooby-Doo theme song. Meanwhile, I opened up the back gate and walked along the other side of it to the place where Tommy had been throwing the scraps for the past three days. When I got there, I was shocked and concerned because I saw nothing. There were no scraps, including the pork chop bones he just tossed over a few minutes ago. I saw him throw them over the fence where they go. Then I heard something moving in the foliage about 20 yards away. I turned and it stopped. I did not know if it was a bear, a wolf, a dog, or whatever, but it was obviously something. Something that was big enough to consume a pile of pork chop bones in an instant. I backed my way to the gate. I went inside and locked it. Then I could see the small trees on the other side of the fence sway as something brushed up against them. I ran over to Tommy's stepladder and peeked over the other side. I could not see anything, but I could tell the saplings in the distance away from the house were not swaying as something departed, or were now swaying as something departed. I went into the house to talk with Tommy about his not so imaginary friend. I had so many questions. How big is this dog? I asked him. He is very big, Tommy answered. Is that why you can reach over the fence and pet him? I asked. Well, yeah, he is big, but I pet him because he is standing up, Tommy told me. What do you mean, standing up? I asked. He is standing up when he walks, Tommy told me. And after many more questions and frustrations, the best I could determine was that this dog was walking around like a person. Like a human? So after several restless nights, Tommy wanted to bring scraps to the dog again after dinner. His mother and I nervously agreed to it. Then I got the shotgun and sat on the porch behind him and waited. After a while, Tommy climbed down the stepladder and came back to the house. I guess he is not hungry tonight, Tommy told me. And then he got distracted with something and began running around the yard playing. I kept staring at the fence. Eventually, Tommy ran into the house to watch TV. I stayed on vigil outside, waiting, watching. Then, about 45 minutes after Tommy had gone in the house, I saw the bushes and trees moving on the other side of the fence. Closer. 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 And then I heard scratching against the fence and saw two black hairy tufts of hair moving, bump up, just over the top of the fence line. Then they disappeared. Then they popped up again. They were ears, pointed ears. I checked to make sure Tommy was in the house. He was glued to the television, of course. I watched the ears bob up above the fence and then squeeze between the maple tree and the fence, then disappear. I jogged over to the stepladder just in time to see the shrubs in the distance shaking as something ran from the house. Whatever the dog was that my son was feeding, it had pointed ears. Bears don't have pointed ears, and wolves are not seven feet tall. The dog never came back after that, but Tommy drew many pictures of the dog. It was a giant, upright, walking dog. I used to quiz him, you know, to try to trick him with pictures of bears, but he always came back to the same thing, the walking dog. Tommy said it was a dog. I know it was not a bear. The rest is anyone else's guess. We lived in southern Arkansas in Dallas County. Since my parents had been divorced since I was around three, I lived with my father. I asked if we could go out over to my mom's house on Saturday, and my dad said yes. So I went over to my mom's place to spend some time with her and chat. 
We hung out, and later that night, her and some friends decided to play some Dungeons and Dragons. We played for around two hours or so. My mom's place can get pretty hot, so I asked her at one point if I can go out and cool off. She said that I could, so we paused the game for the time and I went ahead and went outside to have a nice break. Now my mom lives in the country in Arkansas River Valley, a few hours from where I live normally. Near her place there is this dirt trail to the front of her house. At the time it must have been 11.30 or so, but I can't be sure. I decided to walk that trail for a few minutes just to cool off. I walked for about 20 minutes in all, but about 10 minutes into the walk I heard a stick or a twig break behind me. I was startled and I turned and didn't see anything when I looked. So after a moment of silence, I kept on walking down the trail. I didn't hear anything for another six minutes, but this time it sounded much closer. I was startled again and I was beginning to get creeped out, so I decided maybe it was time to get back to my house. A few seconds going back, I saw something in the middle of the road. I don't think it saw me, and I'm glad that it didn't. The thing was on all fours at the time, but still stood at about five feet tall. Its legs were bent backwards, like the ones of a dog's or a cat's would be, and from what I could see from the mood behind the clouds, it had a reddish-brown fur color. Its torso and arms were shaped like an adult's man, like an adult man, and had the head of a German shepherd, although much bigger and bulkier. I don't really know why I stood there for so long, just looking at the beast, instead of running away like I should have. But due to its appearance, one thing came to me right away. The word werewolf. After I observed it, I tried to sneak away quietly, but I wasn't paying any attention to where I was walking and ended up stepping on a fallen branch. When I did, the creature immediately turned to look at me and stood straight up and began snarling. At that point, it was easily seven feet tall and its eyes glowed a vibrant yellow green. I didn't know what I was going to do. The only thing I could do was run but you should never run from a predator, especially of that size, and I knew better than that. Yet I was still terrified, and I did what my body told me to, and I did what my body told me to. I ran. I ran as fast as I possibly could. The creature growled and growled from behind me, and I heard something heavy crash through the woods behind me. It drew closer and closer at an amazing and natural speed. Just when I think I could feel its breath on the back of my neck, it stopped. As if it was just playing with me, toying with me, chasing me, just to get, get me out of its territory. I didn't dare to look back once, and I saw it there standing at the wood line, looking at something else in the distance. Apparently, something else had made it more curious and interested than me. It didn't pay me any mind after that and simply left, and I went back to running, making it home in only a few moments. When I got inside, my mom asked me what was wrong, why I was crying and upset. I told her I had went for a walk and went down the path and that the wind had forced tears out of my eyes. She said that was fine, though she was very suspicious. We resumed our game. Later on, after everyone had went home, she grabbed my shoulder and asked me what really happened. But I stuck to my story, ignoring her and daring suspicion glances. She told me to never go back on that trail again. This happened October 2010. It was a perfect day. We spent the day roaming around the Mary McDonald Preserve in Grant Township. We had been hiking and the plan was to go to the lighthouse. Take 41 West to Woodland Road and then up to Copper Harbor Lighthouse. But we spent too long in MMP. It was a perfect fall day, misty and just cold enough to be comfortable. We hiked the rocks and spent a lot of early afternoon on Lake Superior shore. Then as it started to get dark, we took a detour through the woods on the way back to the car. We climbed up a bluff to get a view of the shore and woods. I was taking pictures during the last of the light. The fog was starting to cover the shore. It was breathtaking. I was facing northeast where the woods just juts out into the lake. 
My husband was standing next to me when we heard a long, loud scream coming from the woods, about a half mile away. We froze, and we did not even look at each other, just froze. Then it came again, but this time, closer. What is that? My husband whispered to me. Then it came again, and it sounded like an injured or an angry animal, I don't really know which. What the hell is that? I never heard a sound like that before, my husband told me. Well, whatever it is sounds big, and it's getting closer, I told him. We had already started down the rocks toward the car before I finished saying it. It was scary walking down the rocks because we started hearing something behind us. Get to the car, get to the car, get to the car, my husband kept saying. Then we heard the scream again, and this time it was more of an extended howl, which kind of wound down with a muffled growl. Then we could hear something breaking branches and rattling the brushes that moved past us on the left. We made it to the car, thankfully. We got inside and Bob was grappling for the keys. Then, there in front of us, we saw something moving, a humongous lump moving, and then it stood up and the moonlight cracked through the trees and lighted up this thing. It was standing up on two legs. It was staring at us and I grabbed the camera. Bob got the keys and started the car and the headlights came on and the dog man was already gone. Wait, I want to get a picture, I told Bob. Hell no, I don't want to die, he answered. We drove away, and there is a dogman living in the peninsula of Michigan. This encounter happened July 2015. I was born and raised in New York, Manhattan specifically, so you can imagine Copper Harbor, Michigan was a long ways away from whatever I knew, but my cousins and me decided we need to get out and we were tired of just going over the river to Jersey. So we heard about Upper Michigan. Our buddy tells us it's great and so much space there. Okay, granted I'm not a big fan of the whole nature thing, but I figured we would ride the ferry there and see some sights, drink some good beer, just get out for a long weekend. Well, oh my god, the flight took us more than 13 hours with layovers. We had to fly from JFK to Chicago O'Hare and then up the little teeny tiny place called Hooton County Memorial. By the time we got in, we thought we should have went to Hawaii. The flight would have been shorter. Anyway, we got our Alamo rental car, and I'm just happy they have rental cars up there. Then we drove to a place called Lake Fanny Hu Resort. It was okay. One thing I will say is the wide open space kind of made us all spaz out at first. But after the second day, we started feeling mad love for the joint and decided to stay. A whole extra week, in fact. And true enough, after a few days, we were walking and talking about moving up here. I gotta say, it was a nice to breathe fresh air that didn't smell like hot garbage. And you talk to these people, the locals, they ain't frontin' but nothing. They are all what they are, no bridge and tunnel phonies, and this place was never all jammed up with crowds, no waiting online at the bodega for a loaf of bread. It became very enjoyable. But of course, there is some things that take getting used to. Like if you get mad hungry in the middle of the night, you better hope you have a hero in the fridge because they close up shop around these parts early, except the bars. The hotel rooms was gigantic by city standards, and the desk girl kept apologizing for this or that. Hell, I was just dumb happy we didn't have water bugs the size of cabs in the showers. But the locals did warn us, and they said it got brick in the winter. You may not like the wind chill, the girl told us. I'd rather have the wind chillin' me than some mook on 7th Avenue, I told her. The poor girl just looked at me all dead ass, and then the guy started laughing and she started smiling. Do you really like it here? She asked me about it. Do I? I asked her. Forget about it, I answered myself. Again, the girl did not get me. Again, the guys laughed. I'm sorry, what do you mean? The kid asked. You don't want to take it there, sister, Billy said. The kids smiled. We all smiled. We went up to the room. See, all of this stuff was new to us, and once we got used to it, it was fun. You know, a new adventure kind of thing. So this is when we saw the thing. We did not know we was seeing the thing. We just thought, hey, look at the thing. 
it was only after we started talking that we saw the thing that we realized was really saw something else. Good thing, though, because Anthony was already spazzing out about it. How much worse if he realized what he was looking at was not supposed to be there. And this is how it happened. We drove out to the edge of the road there, toward the point of the top or the peninsula. I mean, the upper peninsula is not as well organized as Manhattan, but being as there are only a couple roads, you don't really got to get all tight about it. We was driving up the road by the park there, and around 5 o'clock or so, we pulled into the little cul-de-sac over. It's got lots of woods and, you know, the fall color. We got out. We was walking around. Anthony starts seeing how loud he can fart. Yeah, it was beautiful. This the life, ain't it? Sticky said. Yeah, beautiful, Anthony comes back with. Too bad we don't have that hunting and fishing stick. I mean, if we knew about it, we could open a place here, Sticky said. What do you mean? I know hunting. I can hunt, Anthony said back to Stick, getting all riled up. What do you mean you know hunting? What you gonna hunt with, anyway? You got no arrows, Sticky said. Arrows? What's the matter with you? You don't hunt with arrows. I use my thirty-eight. Anthony told Sticky. And then he started in with Badabading Badabadoom, pretending like he was shooting stuff there. Yeah, you better stick to hunting, hunting for a good slice in the northwest corner, you mook, Stook said. And that was when I remember hearing at the same time, I realized I was looking at the thing. What? Are you kidding me? I told the guys, but they did not see it at first. You buggin? Sticky shouted at me. Yeah, you trippin' on the fresh air. You miss the smell of piss in the air while you're eatin' your bagel with a schmear. Oh, a bagel with a schmear around a dumb good right now. Sticky told Anthony just as Anthony saw the thing. What in the name of Mother Mary of God is that? Anthony said. What's the matter with you guys? Sticky said, stumbling around all loud. Hey, shut up, meathead, I told Sticky. Then Sticky saw the thing. We all automatically started slowly backpedaling toward the rental car. It was then that I looked around and noticed we were alone out there. I remember thinking that if we startled the thing, it might bust open that car like a can of tuna. That rental car did not seem like a lot of help because it was just this tiny little egg-shaped tin can and this animal some kind of angry, pissed-off devil dog. Then dumbass Sticky whispered real loud like, I mean... When Stick whispered, it was louder than most people when they were screaming. What is that? What the hell is that thing? We kept sneaking backward toward the egg car and Sticky kept talking. Is that a lion or what do they call that in the zoo, like a whale monkey? Anthony started laughing. What the hell's a whale monkey, you dumbass? I mean, a bear like a bear that looks like a werewolf from the movies, Sticky finally decided. And though we were a little scared. The mood was still light because the three of us were together. We could not really see that much of the thing. And our ignorance helped because I think we saw the woods as sort of an invisible barrier. I mean, it's not like we were completely stupid. But I know in my mind I felt like that thing might just stay in the trees for now. Like how the animals are in the Central Park Zoo. But you really don't realize they would love to jump and moat and rip ya fucking head off. I started to chill, thinking that thing was not going to come after us. So we meandered back to the toy car, more relaxed for a minute. And then the thing stood up. We all recoiled. That thing was huge. Like Patrick Ewan huge. But weighing four times as much. Then it started walking up the hill, dragging its arms. And then it popped all the way out of the trees, showed its teeth, and screamed. This scream was a scream straight from hell. It was enough to make a statue piss its pants. Next thing I know, we were in the egg car driving as fast as it will go, which was probably about 40 miles an hour. I looked back and saw the thing walk into the road behind us. Sticky and Anthony were both turned all the way around screaming and I was looking in the mirror, afraid to stop driving. That freaking car gave me the ulcers. I kept thinking we could go faster if I just got out and walked. It was like driving a golf cart. We turned the corner and the thing disappeared from our sight. We started laughing. Holy shit, Anthony screamed. Then Sticky asked, did you see that? Then he spit out a bunch of nonsense and stream. 
What was that thing? That thing was wearing a fur coat like Broadway Joe. What the hell was that fur coat? Sticky was referring to the clumps of fur on that thing. It did kind of look like it had a fur coat wrapped around its shoulders, like the kind Joe and Namath used to wear back in the day. So we's good laughing all the way back to the place. We go in and are about to have supper when the front desk guy asks us about, how is your sightseeing today? So we started talking about it, and before, you know, we got a crowd around us. That was when they started telling us that there is no animal that walks around on two legs like that. Then Sticky started in with some stupid story about seeing an animals walking like people at the circus when he was a kid. We shut him up straight quick. But the others, the locals, they was completely shocked. Are you sure it was an animal? It was not just a big person wearing a fur coat? One of the front desk guys asked. If it was, he's wasting his time out in the woods because he should be starting for jets, I said. They laughed but kept asking questions. Oh, that was not a person. You should have seen the teeth on this thing, Anthony told them. We ate, but the people just wanted to keep talking about it. Then one of the old guys, who had not said a thing the whole time, nodded his head and said, Loop Guru. Anthony got all, all, all offended and asked, What do you say? And the guy repeated, Loop Guru. Well, say it. What are you waiting for? Maybe use the girl. Anthony started foaming. At first, I didn't know really know what was going on. And the guy repeated louder and louder. Loop Guru. Anthony stood up in fighting position and told the guy, No, you, look, girl. What a moron. I pulled him back and squared things up. Then the old guy explained to us what he meant. You saw the Loop Guru, and that is French for werewolf. I told you, Sticky whispered, loud enough for even a deaf Loop Guru to hear him. I told you, he repeatedly proud. He repeated proudly. Are werewolves French? Anthony asked me. I don't know, I told him. Well, we got grilled about that werewolf by everybody right until the day we left. And that is our true story. January 1973, Michigan. Tony Abels and I were taking, were taking the trail from what is now Twin Lakes south to Copper Harbor. Four of us would usually go snowmobiling together, but the others had stuff to do at the very last minute. The trail was perfect, very good condition. There must have been a foot or two feet pack the entire way. I was on 1972 Brutanza 580 otherwise known as a Brute 440cc sled. I could rock on that thing. Tony was on a 1967 Ski-Doo Olympic with a Rotax 494cc engine. That thing was fast as shit, but handled like a log. It was dangerous, especially when Tony was on it. But something was wrong with Tony. He was acting all crazy. He almost plowed a plow, grooming the area along the trail on the up, and he just kept going. I had to stop and smooth things over with the plow guy. I'm sure he just did not see you, I said. Tell him to watch it and to slow down. Has he been drinking? The guy asked me. No way. I would not be riding with him if he had, I told the plow guy. Yeah, I, I smoothed things over with the snow smoother. When I caught up to Tony, we were maybe just north of Eagle River, and it was starting to get dark and he was pointing east to me. Then he turns and started blasting down the woods. He's turning, twisting, just going full into it. I followed him, and that was stupid. That was my mistake. There was a lot of snow, and exploring was okay if you were going about it the right way. But this was not right. Something was wrong with Tony, and I was not sure what. Plus, I hated getting off the paths. The paths were great, I mean, you could always have a smooth ride. And now we were crawling between snow-covered trees in the woods. It was all sluggish and lumpy. We must have been a couple miles southeast of Copper Harbor and a few fields were opening up. I did not know if there were lakes or what, but I could see Tony opening up his machine. 
I followed. It was dark now, and I was trying to get his attention to tell him I was going home. I had an electric horn installed that was loud enough, and I was using it. Then I was flashing him, but he just stepped on it. I guess he thought he was funny doing that. He hit a ridge of trees to the north and started crawling around them. I throttled it, opened it up across the field so I could catch up and tell him I was splitting. Just as I get to the ridge, he pushed down the hill and onto another plane. Then he goes. I was just behind him when I hit the field and I took off after him. I thought if I can't catch him at the end of this field, I'll just go home. He'll figure it out. So he's racing across the field. I'm racing toward him. Then I see something running toward him from the woods across the field, going to cut him off. I thought it was a pair of riders with their lights off. I was watching them head straight at him. I was trying to warm him, warn him, but he was not even paying attention. Then, just as he hit the tree line, there was a loud crash. His lights rolled over and shined back through large snow cloud billowing up. I was hoping it would not be too bad. When I got up there, Tony was lying at the base of a tree. He was already dead. Steam was raising up from all the blood on the ground and he was mangled. I had to leave to get help and I found a guy in a house, but it was a ways away. I called the county. County called for an airlift, but when the sheriff got there, he called it off. They could see it was of no use. Tony's arms were both gone. They were laying on the other side of the tree, still in perfect condition, like they had been pulled off, and his head had been smashed up so bad, at least half of it was gone, smeared on the giant oak in front of him, and the machine was partially buried in the tree he rammed. I did not realize that Tony had been drinking. I really did not. But it was true, you could smell the alcohol at the accident, and he had a bottle of Jack in his snowsuit. The cops breathalyzed me, and I was clean. After that, I was talking to a couple of deputies, and I asked, Will they reconstruct this? Because I don't understand how his arms ended up over there like they were pulled off. Then, one of the deputies, who was a know-it-all, there's always one, isn't there, started telling me that when the tracks are still moving and you get jarred, all kinds of things can happen. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. But the other deputy told me, yeah, we will have a reconstructionist we have used before to get up and take a look before we have additional snow cover. Good, I said, because it just doesn't look right to me. You said you saw other writers, the deputy asked me. Yeah, well, I thought it was other writers. I could not really see because of the angle in the dark and the mist on the snow. It looked like writers, I blurted. Well, if they were writers, we'd have tracks, but all we got is animal tracks the deputy said and shined his flashlight down on the ground. A big dog by the looks of it, just one. He rolled his tongue around in his mouth for a minute then told me, I think he might have hit a dog or swerved to miss the dog. I looked down at the tracks. Are you sure that's a dog? Those are huge prints, I told him. I don't know, we'll look into it, he told me. Then the know-it-all wanders back up. Yeah, we'll look into it. Just let us handle this. He probably swerved and intersected the tree, and the machine came back down on top of him, severing his limbs, he told us. I just stood there looking at him. Then he added, Yep, I've seen worse. And he walked away with authority. What an idiot. Well, I have not seen worse, and I have been doing this for over 30 years, the other cop told me. Anyway, we'll let you know what we find out. They took a lot of pictures and Tony was taken away. His sister was distraught. I really don't think she ever recovered. About a month or so later, the good cop called me and asked me a few more questions. He seemed more puzzled than anything else. We picked up those tracks in the East Woods. Then they were running, you know, long skid deep punches, but it looked like it was moving on two feet, which is strange, he told me. Then we lost the tracks in the north part of the woods where he was either joined by another dog or was walking on all fours, he stopped. Weird, I told him. Yeah, it's just that I can't find anyone at DNR who will say definitively that it is a dog print. 
I mean, the running skids are one thing, but the only thing anybody will tell me about the ones where it appears to be walking around the accident site is that it is about four to six times too big to be a canine. Even though they are classic canine prints, he paused and then told me, the best explanation I can get was that maybe it was a small print that melted, then refroze so it looked bigger, but like I told them, they were fresh prints. Weird, I told him. You got that right, he answered. Well, that was it. It was considered a snowmobile accident. One fatality. Michigan has a lot of them, and most of them are because people are drinking and strike trees, logs, etc., or roll the vehicle. Tony did all three. Case closed. I'm not really sure what I saw, but I know I saw something overtake him, and he must have been doing more than 50 miles an hour. But all they found were animal tracks. I wondered if maybe it had been a trick of light and made it look like something moving, and maybe the tracks were just a coincidence. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized it was too much of a coincidence. About a year later, I was trying to get info on the crash and could not find anything. I called the deputy, and he was already working in the Lower Peninsula, near Grand Rapids. He told me he would get back to me. Then he puts me in touch with someone who worked for the coroner. She said they never listed it as a snowmobile fatality because it was undetermined if he had been writing at the time of his death. What the hell is that? I shouted. Then after telling me to watch my language and so forth, I was sent around in a circle of calls that led back to somebody listing the cause of death to be a form of impact injuries and blood loss and all of this stuff. I thought that was weird. When I got back in touch with the deputy, he told me that because they were investigating the thing for a while, that the coroner probably needed to use open-ended language. I had no idea what that meant. I'm assuming that he meant things weren't conclusive, so instead of saying a snowmobile accident, he would use things like blood loss and impact injuries, etc. But I did get a really creepy vibe that it was more than just a clerical error. I really felt like there was something there people were trying to hide. The same something that ran across that field and attacked Tony. I'm not trying to make Tony a martyr. I guess if he was drinking, it's just good that he did not hurt anybody else, but something strange happened that night, and afterwards it just got stranger. I'll never forget how off Tony had acted that night right before his death either. It all just doesn't add up. October 1976, Grant Township, Michigan. We were in college at MMU. It was a cool place to hang out, away from the world, that's for sure. Now, that's about a three hour drive on US 41 North. Spectacularly beautiful in the fall. It was an awesome drive, so we took our time. We had a cooler and it was fully stocked, ready to go. The plan was to do the camping thing and see the wild rock beaches on the far reaches of Lake Superior. After checking into the North Port Motel, we drove down to Manganese Falls. It really felt like we drove to another planet. Such beautiful rugged land. We pulled off alongside Manganese Road at around 5 p.m. because I wanted to take some pictures of the hills. We grabbed a couple of pops out of the cooler and Looking north toward Lake Fannyhu, we saw a giant black dog standing in the trees. It was staring us down. I did not know what I was seeing. I called to Ricky and Scott. They immediately backed up, closer to the car, out of fear. Is that a wolf? Ricky asked. Why is it standing up like that? Tommy asked me. How do I know? I started. Maybe it's trying to climb the tree. Then, this thing started walking toward us, on two legs, standing up. It did not drop down to all fours. It walked toward us and just starred, stared like a drunk surfer, like it was saying, what's up? Then Tommy throws a stick at it. The wolfman leaned forward and started screaming at us, the loudest barking, snarling you have ever heard. I jumped in the driver's seat. Tommy and Ricky jumped in the back seat, on each other's laps, all bunched up. We were screaming when this thing attacked the car. Ricky still had the keys and he threw the keys to me and I started the car. But this thing took a bite out of the top window of the car. It took an actual bite out of the car. 
You could hear it crunch the glass and metal as it ripped a chunk out of the roof. I drove. Ricky and Tommy stared out the back. I checked the rear view. The thing did not chase us. It simply lumbered across the street, heading south across Manganese Road. We looped back around to the motel. The guy at the desk told us that we were not the only ones who ran into the dog man, but he usually does not come out in the daylight. December 1976, Copper Harbor, Michigan. I tracked, I trapped, I hunted. And that winter when my girlfriend told me she saw something outside the house, I was determined to track it down. The more I tracked, the more confusing it got. I was asleep when I felt Jackie shaking me. Hey, there's something out there, she whispered to me. I was up, up with a gun in my hand before I even looked out the window. When I did finally look out the window, I could not see anything. Now here's the messed up part. Where we were living in a pole behind trailer, nobody is supposed to live in these things in the winter, unless you live in Florida, and Carper Harbor is a long way from Florida. My brother told me, if you try to live in that thing in the UP in the winter, you will die. You're going to freeze to death. And they were nights when I thought he was right. The cold was bad but the wind was downright scary. I thought some nights it was going to tip the mobile right over, and then there were other times when it got so cold I had to run the kerosene heater all day. Then I started worrying if we were going to run out before I could find some more. It was messed up. I, I was messed up. We smoked a lot of weed, and Jackie and me both thought all we needed was some bud and a place to sleep. But after winter started in Copper Harbor, I realized we needed more. I figured I would fish and hunt and we'd get high and in the summer drive down to Fort Lauderdale. But I started wondering if we could even survive the first winter. There were good days and bad. Then she sees the thing. Okay, a few nights go and nothing. We listen to music, we get high, we drink, we have sex, and we forget about it. Then a few nights later we both wake up because something is shaking the trailer. And it was not us, and it was not the wind. I'm all gunned up, and I see nothing. I peeked outside, but it was so flipping cold I did not dare it for long. The next morning I went outside. It was that shiny snow, the kind that just holds. There had been no wind, no snow, no precipitation. Everything was preserved. I got all bundled up and started checking it out. I saw tracks and I also saw a dent in our pole behind. I got my gun and started tracking. Jackie was cooking something and told me, yeah, go, whatever. I started following these tracks in the snow. They lead off the shoulder of the road and into the field next to where we were parked over a slope into the woods and over a creek. At first the tracks were a typical biped, side by side, but they were paws, dog paws. No mistaking that. I checked and rechecked. It did not make any sense. Why the dog prints were staggered like a person walking upright on dog feet. I followed the trail and I noticed the step pattern would alternate, sometimes going between quadruped and biped. But it could, it could have only been one animal, unless one was carrying the other. Whenever it went under a branch or through a rough branch, it went quadruped. Then as it approached the stream that was still openly flowing, it stayed quad, then landed on the other side quad and shortly after ascending the hill went biped again. I was able to track the thing until I went to the thick pines. Then I lost the trail. It was the damnedest thing. The whole way back I walked beside it and confirmed everything I saw the first time through. Two feet, four feet, two feet, four feet. It was crazy. I got back to the trailer and Jackie was pissed. I don't want to stay one more night in the freezing shithole, is what she told me. So we drove. We kept driving until we made it to Fort Lauderdale. There is a walking dog that lives in Copper Harbor, Michigan, and I don't know if he is violent, but I don't think he likes trailers. Come to think of it, neither do I. Not anymore and not around that thing. 
January 1978, Copper Harbor, Michigan. I used to have a small house there in downtown Copper Harbor. I repaired snowmobiles in the winter and lawnmowers in the summer and everything else in between. I never gave much thought to stuff I would hear people carrying on about. I did hear the stories of wild wolves, and I think everybody has heard at least one dogman story if you, if you live in Michigan long enough. I thought they were entertaining, but some of the old timers were more serious about it, and yeah, of course, more than a few of them claimed to have seen it. It was a cold, dead winter night in January when I saw a pack of something wandering through my backyard. It is hard to miss in the moonlight over snowy tundra. It's like watching a blowfly crawl across drawing paper. Even a sore thumb would be envious. The next day, Milton Fletcher told me I should be the, on the watch for packs of dogs or wolves or something because one of our neighbors, Reggie Stanton, lost a horse. Nothing but bones left, he told me at the coffee shop the next morning. He was fenced in, but he could jump the fence if there was trouble. That fence was only a suggestion for that horse, Dick Rogers confirmed. Whatever it was, it was able to run down that mare before she could get away. But Stanton said there were only a few tracks. Dog tracks, or canine tracks, rather. There I am the next night. I was in bed and I heard something outside. A rustling, a rumbling. I get out of bed and sure enough, I see that pack of dogs. They are roaming across the open space again, walking across the field behind the house. I went to get my shotgun, but before I turned away and I see a man stand up in the middle of what a crowd of dogs it looked like. What in the name of Doc Holiday? I thought. The crowd of dogs stopped. They all sat around what looked to be a shepherd in the middle. But as my eyes cleared, I could see that the man was not a man. I knew it could just not be a man because the shape just wasn't right. I called Milton. He had been sleeping and he was grumpy. But as soon as I told him, I see the dog pack outside the back of my window. He perked right up. What they doing? He asked me. I gotta tell ya, right now they appear to be sitting in the middle of the field. They are gathered around a bear, it looks like. A bear, I told him. Then immediately... I asked him, do bears run with dogs? Hell no, he assured me. A bear will never run with the dog pack. You got yourself something else there, he finished. I could tell that Milton was waking up as he spoke with me. I'll be there in five minutes, he told me. Before I could say anything, he hung up the phone and I assumed was on his way. I crouched by my window. I was staring out across the field and watched the big guy in the middle of the dogs. Then the guy squatted down. It was not a man. I could see when it moved it was a giant mountain of a wolf. Oh shit, came out of my mouth. Then the big thing stood up and started walking. I mean it was walking in this swarm of mutts of dog sorts. Oh shit, they are coming toward my house. I was thinking that I could just stay in the house. I did not think they were going to break down my walls or anything, but I gotta say as they got closer that big guy in the middle looked like he could certainly rip my walls apart. I checked for shells, that was when I saw my hand shaking, and in a flash the back of my house was being swarmed by dogs, digging. They surrounded the back of the house and began digging at the dirt around my basement. You know, the sight of so many wild dogs working together like was scary all by itself because it was just not right. No sir, that was not right, and to be honest, it scared the living daylights out of me. The big guy, he just sat behind the team of dogs at a distance. Then he stood up again on two legs. Now understand something. I am in the house with the lights off and I could hear these dogs digging at the dirt of my foundation, and I have never heard of anything like this before. Then I heard biting, you know like they were tearing at my sighting with their teeth. Crazy dogs biting into somebody's house? Have you ever heard of such a thing? So, now the giant thing walks forward into the light coming from the front yard. I never saw anything like that in my life. It was not a man. It was more than an ordinary animal. It was some kind of supernatural devil dog. 
and then it screamed. It was like a howl. It threw its head back and shouted to the moon. But that sound was nothing that could describe that noise. Maybe best to say it was like a person being ripped in two. Then the monster brought its head down and rammed straight into my storm windows. Double paneled, insulated storm windows. And it obliterated the outside panel like it was made of candy. Like it barely touched it. Then it began running its nose up and down the panel. That was when I saw the lights coming from Milton's truck pulling in. The big guy snarled and all the digging dogs stopped. I mean, they stopped like union guys on the clock, then they all ran back and surrounded the big guy. I stood up and back towards the door watching the dogs and the big guy, while Milton rapped on the door. Get in here, I screamed. And like most people in Copper Harbor, I didn't lock the door at night, so in rushed Milton. As I turned to call out to him again, toward the front door, there was a loud kabam. And all of a sudden, the wind, the cold, shit is just blowing all over the bedroom. By the time Milton got in my bedroom, the both of us are looking at an empty field behind us and a smashed up broken double pane storm window. I heard it, I heard it. He screamed at me. Milton was referring to the sound of the window being obliterated by the big guy just after he rushed in the front door. Well, we looked around the back of the house and we could see evidence of the wild digging. We could see the trail going across the back of the field. But as the pack traveled in a tight group, they covered their individual tracks. There were still a couple of other encounters with some of the locals with the dog packs that winter, but not from me. I don't know why they took off when Milton arrived. Maybe the big guy was smart enough to know how to make people look like blithering idiots. Maybe that was it really just trying to accomplish that night with me. Because if that pack of wild dogs wanted to kill the both of us that night, they could have easily. And I have seen bears up close, big ones. But nothing compares to the thing I saw leading those dogs around that night. That thing was the king of ferociousness. November 1982, Michigan. Why you gotta shoot at everything, dumbass? I jumped at Tom. Cause why else I got a gun, dumber ass, he answered me. Tom always got gun happy when we went hunting, shooting at everything he could. He had a hard time sticking with the plan, any plan. Nowadays, I think they just call that ADD. Back then it was just called irritating. He liked to hunt and trap, and I did not do the trapping thing. I found it cruel. And as things would have it, we were hiking through the woods in Copper Harbor, in a new area just north of where we had good luck the previous year. Then Tom sees something around late afternoon. First, he thought it was a black bear. Then we could see it was a dog, and a big dog, an unbelievably big dog. We hunt for food source in Copper Harbor. We would always try to load up on venison for the winter. Everyone knew, or everyone I knew hunted for food, but even if you didn't get anything, it was a great way to get out and get exercise in fresh air. But sometimes Tom got on my nerves with his impatience and random shooting. He was like a kid with his first BB gun, only his rifle now had deadly bullets. At present, Dumbass was hunting the stray dog or wolf we saw. But whatever it was, we weren't going to eat it. So why Tom now suddenly had to Tarzan after it, I don't know. Sometimes he just needed to kill something, and he seemed to be getting worse in the past few years. I had already decided this would be the last time I went out with Tom. I'd rather spend time in a quiet tree stain with myself than trying to keep Tom in check all the time. I was planning to go to Watersmeet in the Ottawa National Park next, while deer season was still open and a few of our friends all agreed to keep the, tricks, the trip secret from Tom. Maybe it was because I was trying to humor his sorry ass that I let him drag me northward on this day. But for whatever reason, we wandered here because Tom didn't care what land we were on if he was following a trail or got one of his feelings. Then that was where we went. It was fun when we were kids, but it had been getting old in the past few years, especially since it seemed to yield less and less game every time. Then, last year he took a shot at movement, and as all hunters know, you don't do that. It turned out to be a hunter in camo, he could have killed the guy. 
and a few weeks after that, Tom dragged me over a stream into an overgrown backyard where he thought he saw a buck. The buck jumped sure enough. Tom shot. Tom missed, and we heard a lady screaming. Turned out, Tom shot right through her kitchen window where she had just finished doing dishes. A minute earlier, and he would have been facing manslaughter charges. So yeah, this was it. We dropped our gear and planned to settle and eat before going out before dusk. I started getting out some food when I turned around and there was Tom going into the brush. What the hell? Where are you going? I asked him. I'm going to get that, he answered me. That's a prize wolf. I'm going to hang its hide in my shop. I did not even say anything. I knew it was pointless. I sat down and began unwrapping my Snickers bar. I was so hungry I thought I could eat three of them. I turned around to grab the milk pint when I heard a shot. Then another. Then another. I stood up and I looked and I could not see anything. I waited, then went back to eating my Snickers. I walked back to sit when I heard the brush rattling. Something was running at me. I looked down the slope and could see it was Tom. He was hustling faster than I ever saw his fat ass move before. But I knew something was wrong this time. My reflex was that he must have shot somebody. It could be all the rifle shots were from him. I dropped my food and grabbed my rifle. I had a bad feeling come over me. I'm calling to him as he is running up the hill. He did not answer me. He was flushed white and staring at me with panicked eyes. Yeah, this was going to be bad. I knew it. He gets to the top of the hill and he was gasping and gulping. He stopped to bend over and catch his breath. It's coming. Gun. 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 He spit out at me while pointing at my rifle. He strained to stand up and I look around and didn't see a thing. What the hell's going on? I started screaming. What the hell did you do? I barked. He gasped and stood up. He was breathing hard and gripping his rifle. He looked over the hill with me. We saw nothing. What is going on, goddammit? I screamed at him. Tom just stared around. It was really creepy. His face was terrifying. It looked like his eyes were about to leap out of their sockets. Then he whispered. It was walking. It stood up and started walking at me. He told me. It was... It was walking toward me like a man. He hushed out. What, the dog? I asked. That dog was walking upright? That was not a dog, man. He started rambling. It turned around and started walking at me. I shot it three times. He started hyperventilating at this point. It, it just kept coming and, and snarling. Probably just a fucking black bear, you idiot. I interrupted him. Bears look like they are walking sometimes. It's not a big deal. No, man. This... This thing walked like a person, and I shot it, and it didn't go down, he told me with a quivering voice. We stood there for a moment, and I remember it distinctly. I was looking down the hill and just started shaking my head. I really thought he had gone crazy, and I had enough of his bullshit for one day. Let's go home, I told him. I turned around to grab the packs, and there it was. A giant black dog. It looked like a German Shepherd. It was standing on two legs like a human and staring at us about 30 feet away. It must have weighed well over 300 pounds. It was huge, thick, and very heavy. I lowered my rifle at it. I stood there. It stood there. Then it took a step forward. Then another. I did not shoot. I couldn't. I was just shocked. I was in total shock. It walked on two legs, very naturally. Then it put its head down, like a bull about to charge. Don't shoot it, Tom told me. You'll just make it mad. Tom telling me not to shoot something was even more shocking than seeing a dog man. Tom threw his gun down. Then he told me, just throw it down. Maybe it'll go away. I did not throw my gun down. I was too scared. Then the thing snarled and walked right up to me. Just don't do anything, Tom told me, and he really sounded like he was crying at this point. The dog man walked past me, started sniffing Tom. 
I turned to watch it get right up to Tom's face. It was sniffing Tom just like a dog would and dribbled slobber all over the shoulder and chest of his shirt. I thought it was going to bite Tom, so I shot. I shot the thing in its chest. It just turned and looked at me. I fired again and then Tom slapped the rifle out of my hand. The dog man leaned forward and started barking and growling just inches away from my face. The next thing I know, or the next thing I knew, Tom was grabbing on me and telling me to put my arms out. Then we stood there, the both of us, with our arms sticking out, palms down. It's, uh, it's a respect for dogs, he stuttered out to me. Then the thing dropped to all fours and ran into the woods. I kept thinking afterward that maybe it was a rabid wolf or something. We talked about it. I suppose it is possible it could have sure survived direct shots if it had a really thick hide. I suppose, but not a 338 Winchester Magnum. And we were not interested in going into the woods to search for it, just to see if it was dead. I kept trying to think there must be a natural or rational explanation. Maybe it learned to walk upright and searching for food. And maybe it wasn't search supernatural. Maybe it was just an adaption or something. But I knew it was all bullshit. That was some kind of werewolf in the northern woods of the upper peninsula. Tom never did go hunting ever again, and neither did I. I live in an area of North Vancouver, British Columbia called Lynn Valley. It's beautiful in the fall and runs into a lot of sloping hills and mountains in the area. It's a pretty common occurrence to have issues with bears and other wildlife getting into your trash and belongings. So the bins are always usually pretty securely closed. This particular experience happened roughly three weeks ago and we're still terrified to this day and still don't know what it was. Our garbage cans are pretty visible from our living room windows. This is because of the position of our garage and the gate to the front. It was about 11.30 p.m. and my wife and I were still watching TV before going upstairs. All of a sudden, we started hearing some thumping against the house from the large plastic garbage bin. We figured a bear had gotten over our fence. We peeked out of our curtains together and were shocked at what we saw. The thing stood on hind legs and had dark shaggy fur, but it definitely wasn't a bear. It looked muscular and skinnier and had a snout like a coyote or even a wolf. It ripped through our garbage, grunting and growling. We were completely terrified right there in the window. I just wanted to look away, but at the same time, I was morbidly fascinated with what I was looking at. After about another minute or so, the thing ran to the back of our yard and jumped the fence. From how it looked, I would guess it had to have been a werewolf. What else could it be? I just hope it finds its dinner elsewhere. On December 16th, 2008, three of my friends and I decided to go into the woods near my house in Rodtucket, Rhode Island. We came across an old waterway that would stop flooding. As we followed it, we were going further and further into the woods. I've never gone so far into the woods before ever, but decided I was up to it as we continued to venture on. I don't get scared easily, and at the time, didn't believe in paranormal or cryptids or any of that nonsense, or so I thought then. But things got really quiet, really quick, and that really creeped me out. At 1.15 a.m., we saw a black figure moving through the woods. It was, I would say roughly given the distance, six feet tall or more. The creature's face was elongated like that of a wolf, but it was humanoid in appearance and ran even like a human bipedally. It moved faster than I could ever at top speed. Whenever it stopped, it kept looking around as if it knew we were there. The creature took off shortly after and didn't stick along. None of us wanted to move at all in case it came back, but we decided to leave the area immediately. Since that day, we have only told a handful of people about our experience in the woods, and my friends wish to remain unnamed and anonymous. Now comes with this creature. Given the stated details, I would have to say it was probably a werewolf. I would have never believed this originally if I did not see it from my own eyes. My sighting took place around 11.30 p.m. November 4th, 2009. I worked for the local 73 toll road. 
in California, and lately we had some construction on the surrounding roads for the past few months. I was a third shift manager. Every night driving home, I would continue to take the exact same route at the exact same time about every night. But on this particular night, I was coming off the exit on the 133 road, and I'll never forget what I saw that night. While stopped at the stoplight, I saw a group of three large four-legged creatures that came out from the tree line on the road. I tried to convince myself I was seeing things. I made the left turn at the light, and while the speed limit was still 40 miles per hour at this point, I had looked up and almost peed my pants. Those three beasts were running upright. I could see now that these creatures now were wolves, around 6.5 feet tall roughly, and they could easily have weighed 200 if not more pounds each. They had snouts and mouths that could almost be expressive, and the fur was very dark, although there wasn't enough light to tell if it was dark brown or black. My car being the six cylinder it could, it could get going if need be. I was going 45 miles per hour at the moment and the giant wolves were keeping up with me with ease. I then put the pedal to the metal and sped up to 70. I was sweating profusely and having a panic attack. As I sped up to 70, the wolves stopped following me. Considering I was about to enter a high traffic area, the wolves in front seemed to stop immediately and just watch me drive off. I did not hear any howling before or after the sighting. I proceeded to head home immediately and told my girlfriend what I had saw, and she deemed it just my imagination or sleeplessness. I also told my coworkers the next day, and nobody believed them, and nobody believed me. I know I'm not crazy. I know I'm not crazy, and I know what I saw. I have still been taking the same route home every night, and I have not yet run into them ever again.